Um, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, as always, to Nathan and Petar for what has been a, a very scintillating week um, so far here in Dubrovnik. Um, does everybody have a handout? OK. Um, so I'll just briefly explain um, this paper. It's the first chapter of a larger project that um, wants to theorize um, femininity um, and perhaps more broadly gender in uh, 19th century literature, um, specifically how these sort of forms of femininity and, and individuation emerge outside of um, you know, dominant liberal model of the individual. Um, so the paper has three sections, and I'm beginning just very briefly with that short um, excerpted poem at the top of the handout. Oh, the other thing I might just say is that um, this is a, it feels like a very literary paper. It has a kind of wider theoretical scaffolding that is, I think, at moments more muted. So I do need to expand it a little bit, and um, you know, I'd be uh, grateful to know if you think that there's places where I could have a more explicit engagement um, with, the, with the theoretical. OK. How do we get from a one to a two? In the business of stealing tarts, this appears to be the main question, occupying the king of hearts in Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, who, in the concluding trial for the knave of hearts, fixates on a nonsense poem produced by the white rabbit as evidence, quote. And he went on muttering over the verses to himself. We know it to be true. That's the jury, of course. If she should push the matter on, that must be the queen. What would become of you? What indeed? I gave her one, they gave him two. Why, that must be what he did with the tarts, you know. This generally overlooked poem, published separately by Carroll, or as he was better known outside of the literary world, um, Charles Ludwig Dodson, in 1855 in the periodical Comic Times, is resurrected in the chapter Alice's Evidence, right before the stolen tarts reappear in their entirety in court, and before Wonderland <coughs> dissipates, leaving Alice dreaming in her sister's lap. After learning that this fantasy world's inhabitants spend all their time callously ordering one about and making one repeat lessons, such seemingly redundant puns about ones and twos signify nothing to Alice at the end of Wonderland's nonsense trial, not even, quote, an atom of meaning. Yet getting from a one to a two constitutes Alice's entire project in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and its sequel, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. Across both books, the movement from a one to a two upends existing foundations of the one, the single or the particular individual, as Alice tentatively conceives of herself, and the two, as she considers the many pairs, doubles, and multiple fantasy creatures in Wonderland. Counting herself as a one, thus becomes the jumping off point for Alice to decide what her identity will be, and subsequently exposes the ways in which getting from a one to a two what Mladen Dollar calls the most elementary of all operations in mathematics, comes laden in the Alice books with repercussions for a central feminist problem, namely how to account for and represent sexual difference. In this paper, I return to sexual difference to read it as a possible site for the neutralized and abstracted subject's undoing. An undoing that points to new ways of thinking about difference that sever themselves from an arithmetic of aggregation and addition. In the following three sections, I explore Alice's reckoning with sexual difference in three registers, that of subjectivity, materiality embod and embodiment, and finally, futurity. My reading of the Alice books allows for, or I hope that it allows for, the theoretical discourses underwriting these registers, psychoanalysis, new materialism, and socialist feminism, which are not uh, typically um, theoretical fields that are you know, thought together, um, to be brought together under the rubric of counting, and consequently imagines a different matrix for being in the world. As Alice falls down the rabbit hole to Wonderland, she poses a question that Nina Auerbach has identified um, as a, a rare one for children, children's book protagonists. Who am I? 
Um, so that's what she asks herself, kind of in the first few pages of the story. Rather than ask where she is, Alice asks who she is, an interrogation of self in a moment of quite literal free fall. This is an inquiry that is profoundly entangled with the overlapping problems of gender and sexuality. Alice has an inkling of this entanglement early in the story when a pigeon asks her, well, what are you? I can see you're trying to invent something. The narrator then notes, I'm a little girl, said Alice rather doubtfully. The logic of subject formation, ever precarious, as Alice testifies to in this quotation, um, has nevertheless been foundational to the feminist study of gender and sexuality. As I trace in the following sections, Alice's inquiry reveals the cohabiting of different itineraries figured by the terms woman or girl, gender, and sexuality. The Alice books, while not presuming to resolve the tensions inherent in these terms for feminist inquiry, offers up counting as a mode to rearticulate gendered and sex subjecthood in ways that are alternatively enabling, perilous, and singular. So section one, counting ones and twos. At first glance, the Alice's book's relationship to counting and mathematics appears ubiquitous and uncomplicated. A mere satire of the earlier religious didacticism that defined children's books since the 18th century. The Alice stories encode mathematical riddles and puzzles, um, as well as recitations of moral verse, put to Alice by Wonderland's creatures, ones that typically never get solved. It is evident from these tedious interactions that engaging with numbers in the form of, quote, sums and lessons um, quickly leads Alice to boredom and frustration, rather than delight and amusement. As professor of mathematics at Christ Church, Oxford, um, Dodgson's, or Carroll's, most enduring contribu contribution to the field was largely pedagogical, rather than scholarly, as he worked consistently to make mathematical puzzles a recreation for English children, a departure from the rote memorization to which they would have been subjected in the Victorian classroom. So for instance, he published a series of uh, mathematical riddles he called a tangled tale um, in a children's periodical. That was actually um, meant to be for middle class girls. Um, yet in an era of rapid innovation in the field of mathematics, from the development of non-Euclidean geometries to the rising interest in symbolic algebra, and finally the discovery of set theory by George Cantor, Dodgson largely defended the older models of mathematical scholarship going so far as to publish a treatise on Euclidean geometry, Euclid and his modern rivals in 1879. As Helen Pysier has convincingly argued, the new mathematics, such as symbolic algebra, with its emphasis on the arbitrariness of truths rather than their absoluteness, disturbed Don Dodgson's, quote, commitment to the meaningfulness of mathematics. At the same time, she argues, the root of his nonsense verse may also be in symbolic algebra, which stressed in mathematics structure over meaning. Carroll's approach to mathematics as a unique site of knowledge for adults as well as children has further contributed to perhaps the most notorious claim about his life and work, namely that he maintained an erotic attachment to little girls. In that perspective, which dominated much of the 20th century criticism of the Alice books, mathematics serves as a controlling mechanism for the male writer, delimiting the boundaries of a fantasy world over which he is the sole master. The main example serving this entrenched critical par paradigm is a photograph of Alice Little, daughter of Henry Little, um, Dean of Christ Church, who inspired um, these books and named after her. Um, so the photograph is inserted into the last page of the manuscript version of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which Carroll illustrated and bound himself uh, in 1864. The image is framed by a hand-drawn border that UC Knopfelmacher notes intriguingly resembles the mathematical symbol for infinity, one ostensibly framing a face that cannot age. The photographic image, one of thousands Dodgson took of his female child friends, that's what he called them, seems to neatly pull together various forms of erotic fixation under the symbolic power of the infinity symbol, which closes the gap between youth and age, girlhood and manhood, past and present, and subsequently, in Catherine Robson's words, confounds temporality. If we turn from Carol to his fictional protagonist, 
It's clear from Alice's repeated encounters with the most basic unit of mathematical thinking, counting, that these forms of engagement reveal more complex possibilities for her sense of, quote, who she is than any of these well-established critical readings have allowed. We may initially recall that any form of counting in the 19th century is marked by the formalization of the British census and a bureaucratic commitment to the taxonomized and abstracted individual. By 1865, the year of Wonderland's publication, Britain had instituted seven censuses and the, quote, dull, dry parade of stupid figures, as Mary Poovey explains regarding census counting, had been sufficiently stripped of any imaginative power in the public eye to be able to perform purely statistical labor on behalf of the state. Yet writers mulled over the imaginative <coughs> capacity of and limits to counting and abstracting bodies since the census's inception in 1801. Wordsworth's We Are Seven, so that's the second um, excerpt on your handout. It's not the whole poem. Um, published in Lyrical Ballads the same year as Thomas Malthus's An Essay on the Principles of Population, so this is 1798. A sociological polemic that contributed directly to Britain's adoption of its first census holds open the possibility within poetic language that enumeration is always fraught with multiple forms of unclassifiable difference. Because counting often lays bare what cannot in fact be counted, it serves as a, as a means to expose and reveal difference in its infinite gradations. In Wordsworth's poem, an older male speaker addresses a, quote, little cottage girl who refuses to leave out her dead and absent brothers and sisters from her family count, insisting that, quote, while two are gone to sea and two of us in the churchyard lie, oh, master, we are seven. The poem, as scholars have noted, is more than a simple meditation on death. Um, it indexes several vital oppositions, including the blurring of absence and presence, a rural nostalgia versus an unimaginative urban count, and even in odd numbers. Aaron Fogel reads the poem as an example of anti-censuses, artistic works that drive beyond or work against <coughs> current operating assumptions about enumeration, and that expose the aesthetics of what we take to be non-aesthetic counting procedures. What is striking um, to me about Wordsworth's exploration of these counterintuitive possibilities within counting is that this procedure is clearly gendered as well as classed um, as the alternative title to the poem, The Little Maid and the Gentleman, um, evinces. The poem's addressee moves from a, quote, simple child in the first stanza to a little cottage girl and finally a sweet maid whose beauty made me glad in later sections of the poem. Yet while the speaker is able to identify the girl with increasingly gendered precision, he can't rectify disputes in the poem as to who gets to count. In its act of simultaneous gendering and uncounting then, We Are Seven registers an alternative count that lies outside of the rigid taxonomies of bureaucratic personhood through the figure of girlhood, one more attentive to the rift of subjectivity away from the neutralized contours of an enumerated one. The girl's count is further not merely beholden to a form um, of Wordsworthian nostalgia, but points to the ways in which sexual difference, everywhere present in the poem, but never its main problematic, intervenes in the deceptively simple figuring of poetic individuation. Tracing a continuity between We Are Seven and the Alice books appears to satisfy the paradigmatic story of the children's books, books development in the Victorian period, in that this narrative involves a negotiation on the part of Victorian writers of the trope of the idealized romantic child, solitary, pastoral, innocent, that increasingly appeared under siege <coughs> to middle class readers in the 19th century. In my view, this trajectory can be imagined differently through the disruptive count of girl femininity, which not only posits a form of anti-census thinking, but also an anti-abstracted child, one who cannot be particularized through religious moral instruction, nor the increasingly liberal logic of state-sanctioned personhood that aims to replace it. What we encounter in the Alice books is the promise of a different kind of oneness that initially takes shape at the level of counting bodies, including one's own, 
Marking the count is a site of subject formation and specifically of gender formation, where gender reveals and troubles the problematic neutrality of abstract subjectivity. Like the little maid of We Are Seven, who refuses the distinctions that mark a certain type of modernizing personhood, ones and twos allow Alice to recalibrate conventional ideas of difference and similitude, rather than to confirm them. Witness an, an early passage from A Pool of Tears in Wonderland, in which Alice, having grown enormously tall from eating a piece of cake, um, wonders where to go next um, in the sort of frustrating, <coughs> changeable um, fantasy realm. So this is the long passage um, on the handout that I'll read out. I wonder if I've been changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, uh, that's the great puzzle. And she began thinking over all the children she knew that were of the same age as herself to see if she could have been changed for any of them. I'm sure I'm not Ada, she said, for her hair goes in such long ringlets and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all. And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things. And she, oh, she knows such a very little. Besides, <laughs> besides, she's she, and I'm I. And oh dear, how puzzling it all is. I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see, four times five is 12, and four times six is 13. And four times seven is, oh dear, I shall never get to 20 at this rate. <laughs> So this moment is striking in that Alice puzzles out the question of her subjectivity in ways that are pointedly neither sentimental nor customary. Her exploration of difference bears little resemblance to the idealized relationships that characterize Victorian girlhood, for this is precisely the kind of domestic ideology that Alice has left behind. Issuing the usual figures of authority, parents, teachers, um, even other kind of hostile uh, creatures in Wonderland, Alice evokes a lateral sequence of other little girls in which apparent sameness and even redundancy begins to produce an idea of Alice's singularity. By this I mean not being Ada or Mabel reveals a form of minimal difference proving um, from other little girls, proving that she can't substitute them for herself. Or to put it another way, we can possibly approach Alice's reckoning in more overtly ma mathematical terms, as, to, as the failure to extend the counting of a one as a replication of itself. Um, we might think of this as one plus one plus one. This is rendered clear from the syntax of the following reflection. Besides, she's she and I'm I. It is all the more intriguing that this phrase, which does not presume a stable eye that pre-exists the articulation of itself within counting, instantly shifts Alice's thinking back to the conventional modes of mathematical sums and calculations that represent a contrasting failure of self-understanding. As these multiplications foreclose her ability to get to 20 and to open up any idea of imaginative possibility or futurity, and of course the math is also wrong. Needless to say. We therefore find that Alice has further exceeded normative forms of identification in the way that Susan Stewart describes. Um, so she says, when one counts for counting's sake, the classification and the hierarchies of the everyday life world are flattened into a line of infinite possibility. The failure to get from a one to a two through modes of simple repetition or replication becomes the site of Alice's inquiry into who she is, a question that is inescapably about sexual difference. Two scenes from Freud's account of subject formation make this clear, while also creating murkiness around subject formation, gender, and sexual difference itself that characterizes these, um, these Freudian accounts. So in some psychical consequences of the anatomical distinction between the sexes, this is from 1925, uh, we find that the little girl's curiosity about who she is, is the pivot around which turns the very question of sexual difference as a cut or an unaccountable form of otherness rather than an easy polarity or opposition. Freud observes that the little girl apprehends the genitalia not of a mother or a father, but of, quote, a brother or playmate, strikingly visible and of large proportions, so the dreaded phallus. 
This moment calls attention to the visibility of a form of horizontal asymmetry in what Joan Kopchak has called the exclusive province of the girl. This is because the girl's distinct form of sexual inquiry reveals sexual difference as de-universalized, as the problem of the two rather than the one. This is notably a form of two-ness that cannot collapse back into its component parts. That is not a compilation of two halves that make a whole. Ones and twos here name an uncertain and horizontal, so it's between playmates or siblings rather than parents, landscape of sexual difference that is singularizing as it divides and tears a subject from an always retreating fantasy of wholeness. The girl's singularity is therefore precisely not an identity formation in the form of singleness, but a question posed to such fantasies that ultimately unravels them. Yet the whiff of penis envy continues to haunt this passage in Freud, um, and Kopchep re rejects it entirely as a misstep. Um, it reminds us that bad feelings often accompany scenes of subjection, subjectification within sexual difference. It is a vague sense of things that Alice notices from the onset of the narrative and that distinguishes her from Wonderland's more literal-minded inhabitants, her meeting with the caterpillar suggesting as much. So they're having a conversation, she says. But when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will someday, you know. And then after that, into a butterfly. I should think you'll feel a little queer, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. All I know is it would feel very queer to me. Returning to Alice's working out of who she is, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a kind of mathematical iterability, quad gender, we can see how it might also bear a resemblance to another Freudian scene, this time from group psychology and the analysis of the ego. In his much discussed chapter on identification, Freud notes that identification is, quote, the earliest and original form of emotional tie, ambivalent from the very first. The desire to be and the desire to have differentiate identification from pure sexual object choice, suggesting that there may be two ways that a child comes into subjectivity, through gendering to be and sexuality to have. Both are partial, that is never privy to totalizing schemas. And here the grammatical slippage in Wordsworth's poem between the little maid stating we are seven rather than I have seven siblings seems to um, you know, uh, get at this problem as well. Yet for the boy in Freud's account, identification and sexual object choice tend to merge in the Oedipal complex without complication. The problem occurs when Freud brings up the little girl. In cases where object choice is replaced entirely by identification, Freud turns to two instances of symptom formation um, to kind of define girlhood. So one um, is about Dora from the kind of infamous case study um, in which she catches her father's cough. And another um, is at a girl's boarding school in which all the pupils, quote, catch a fit. Um, in a jealous and identificatory response to one girl at the boarding school receiving a love letter. Um, so this example is a model of feminine collectivity, a wanting to be like, as fundamentally of the order of the imitation or the copy. C.N. Nye's reading of the affective dimension of this Freudian scene, however, is instructive in pointing to the ways in which femininity often operates as an unruly copy or a, quote, bad example. An example given immediately to imitation in the form of envy or emulation, ultimately emptying the example of its exemplarity. Insofar as this reading may de-universalize gender by suggesting that identification and its bad feelings can consolidate a non-idealized femininity, Freud showcases a disciplinary sp splitting between gender and sexual difference that has posed an ongoing problem for scholars working under the signpost of feminism. What ultimately guides us back to Alice's inaugural question, who am I, is that neither sexual difference as a cut or asymmetrical <coughs> two-ness, nor gender as bad exemplarity can ground a model of subjectivity founded in originary oneness. Rather than suggest the stability of the terms gender, girl, woman, and sexual difference, Alice's count seems to propose that all three hold the possibility for a productive not-quite-oneness not in their very tenuous complicity. Section two, um, it's called Weird Forms. 
These Freudian moments offer a powerful preliminary axis on which to understand sexual difference as what fundamentally cannot be counted under existing notions of what counts, so in the vein of what matters as well. Yet sexual difference functions as a form of difference that is insistent and non-negligible, that refuses not to be counted. This is largely how Lacan reads the problem of sexual difference. But in Wonderland, Alice seems to have taken this detotalized count of sexual difference even further. The story's exploration of forms of asymmetry and relationality that unravel conventional notions of girlhood subjectivity also functions at the level of the material body rather than only of the unconscious subject. In that, Alice experiences a number of bodily changes in her first adventure in Wonderland, from, quote, shutting up like a telescope to growing too big for the white rabbit's house. Um, the narrative blatantly ironizes the notion of growing up in the usual fashion. These physical changes, which on the surface manifest a shifting sense of one's agency over the body, are also at the forefront of Alice's negotiation of who she is. They exceed mere satire on Victorian middle-class adulthood because they point out the instability of 19th century anxieties about the female body as needing to be sort of contained or restricted. And even more crucially, attempt to recalibrate Alice's very humanness, in which sexual difference is not a cultural appendage to the body, but a modality of being and orientation to the world. What I read here as a form of corporeal dynamism reflects Alice's estranged encounters with the body as foreign matter that is not simply terrifying, but often exhilarating. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope there ever was, exclaims Alice at the beginning of A Pool of Tears. Goodbye, feet. Earlier, the narrator of Wonderland observes, she generally gave herself good advice, for this curious child was very fond of pretending to be two people. But it's, but it's no use now, thought poor Alice, to pretend to be two people, while there's hardly enough of me left to make one respectable person. So here, ones and twos work to reference a relationship to the body as undifferentiated, as, quote, one respectable person. Individual wholeness is posited in terms of social integrity, so what it means to be respectable, as well as bodily integrity, so the idea that there's physically hardly enough of, of me. But neither form of self-sameness is of value in Wonderland. The matter of maintaining this sort of integrity across time and space becomes precisely that, a question of matter of bodily integrity, not as it refracts the coherence of Victorian gender ideology, but as it forecasts the openness of possibility, when one's relationship to an environment involves a certain amount of contingency at the level of the corporeal. What Kira was on at Tompkins elaborates as, quote, an idea of the body as having a life and a conversation of its own with itself. This unraveling of the rigidity of corporeal oneness finds its fullest expression in the Alice books' visual register, in which Sir John Tenniel's illustrations laboriously excavate the possibility of Alice's relationship to the fantasy world around her. Exploring the contrast between his and Carol's own more rudimentary illustrations to the manuscript version of Wonderland allow us to register this dynamism. So there's an example on your handout. It's a bit hard to see Carol's, Carol's sketch. Um, but on a basic level, Tennille swaps out an ostrich um, for Carol's flamingo. Oh, sorry, it's the other way around. Um, Tennille kind of um, switches Carol's ostrich for a flamingo. But the primary difference between the illustrations is that Tennille situates Alice in her environment. Whereas Carol's drawing finds Alice in a more or less utilitarian relationship to the non-human world of Wonderland, Tenniel puts forth their entanglement. To be sure, in a later essay entitled Alice on Stage, Carol readily acknowledged that his earlier sketches, quote, re rebelled against every law of anatomy or art. So he acknowledges that they're not very good, basically. This is, however, despite his careful plans for the drawings, inspired by multiple visits to the Natural History Museum at Oxford with the Little Sisters, and even a few photographic studies of skeletons and other miscellany done in the late 1850s. 
By contrast, contemporary reviewers of the Alice books generally praise Tennille's illustrations, notably for how they did, quote, justice to the exquisitely wild, fantastic, impossible, yet most natural history of Alice in Wonderland. So clearly, the differences amount to more than just the sophistication of the drawings themselves. The wild, fantastic, impossible, yet most natural history of the Alice books describes a dynamic, materialist world that needs to be read less as an idealist, idealistic nonsense universe than as a landscape of various kinds of decouplings, mind and body, human and non-human, ones and twos. Such decouplings open up a thinking of difference and individuation that is untethered to the binary of sexual difference haunting most of the 19th century's more conventional ideological investments. So strangely enough, Carol's Alice books were not the only texts to treat girlhood as a problem for matters ongoing transformations in the wake of 19th century materialist debates around organic and inorganic forms. John Ruskin's The Ethics of Dust, a series of lectures that extend Wordsworth's faintly patronizing um, schema of an older male in conversation with a young girl, or in this case, the set of young girls, was published concurrently with the first Alice book in 1865. And it proposes a dialogue around the process of chemical composition and decomposition. <laughs> Notably, Ruskin's old lecturer refers to his girl pupils as, quote, crystals and atoms, and finally as dust, themselves who are, quote, crystalline in brightness and who charm infinitely by infinitude of change. So typically read as another instance of masculine fetishism that seeks to not only control but also inhabit a fantasia of girlhood. Um, the ethics mobilizes the hardness of crystals together with the mutability of matter to produce a seeming erotics of the girl's unpredictable body that may appear adjacent to Carol's own project. Ella Mershon begins to read Ruskin's text differently by suggesting that inorganic matter was, quote, promiscuous because it could enter into, and again, this is uh, Mershon, endless rearrangements, shifting kaleidoscopically into many forms, forms that were, often least, uh, that were often stubbornly asexual. Such promiscuous or unruly combinatory powers speak to the failure of heterosexual modes of distinction to delimit gendered reproduction, the making of a one into a two. Crucially, Ruskin's text proposes the combinatory powers of matter as fractal rather than binary. In a section entitled Crystal Orders, the lecturer instructs the girls to, quote, make diamonds of yourselves, which quickly becomes a conversation about why all the nicest things seem to divide into threes. The lecture follows by explaining to the young girls the process of, quote, crystallizing quickly, a process that follows the pattern of fractal growth to infinity. Fractal iteration seeks new forms within self-similarity. Its mathematical roots recur to the 17th century work of Leibniz and the later 19th century findings of Felix Klein and Henri Poincaré. Of course, the formal language of fractals only develops in the later 20th century in conjunction with a growing interest in computer-based modeling. And despite the old lecture peevishly noting that the mathematical part of crystal crystallography is quite beyond girl's strength. He also cannot help but claim that it is full of the most curious teaching for you. Both Ruskin and Carroll then testify to a resolutely fractal logic of iteration in their address to girlhood as gendered matter. The Alice books then direct our attention to those areas of mathematical thinking that produce forms of individuation within minimal difference whether these forms are gendered selves, crystals, or even atoms. These are, as C. C. Namali Serpal has put forth um, in an essay on Caroline Levine's forms, quote, weird forms, not pure matter, not pure form, but they are, according to Sir Paul, all over the political spectrum and undeniably fraught with racial and gender politics. The political stakes of a weird form resonate within the historical context of the mid-19th century as well as beyond its margins. 
They push back against a representative model of subjectivity as a stable formation that grounded mid-Victorian liberal politics, as Elaine Hadley has shown in um, her work, Living Liberalism. So this is just a quote from that. The embodied forms are distinctive formations of the bodily, materializations of the liberal individual that attain fixity and surface through their reiteration, reiterated performance over, over time. The concept of bodily matter as a social process of materialization <coughs> is especially crucial for forms of abstract embodiment in the mid-19th century in Britain. So in Hadley's language of abstract embodiment, the liberal subject is at once abstracted through a disinterested process of cognition, absolutely formalized, and a body who can pragmatically live out those liberal ideals. What my readings of Wordsworth, Carroll, and Ruskin reveal is that gender is not simply a bodily problematic that threatens abstraction, but a rupturing on both fronts such that the stability of liberal ideation becomes impossible. There's a certain freedom in the weird here. Weirdness calibrates not to some kind of constitutive exclusion from the normal, but to a reframing of what normative modes of indiv individuation are and can be. Serpol makes clear that some forms simply do not function programmatically and are not given to ordering. And to the pre-Socratic atomists, notably Democritus, who coined a particularly intransigent neologism, den, D -N, to describe atoms as um, less than nothing or not quite one. The material world may simply just be a loose coalition of weird forms in all their fractal possibility. In Wonderland, then, not making, quote, an atom of meaning, nor, quote, one respectable person, collectively reroute Alice's question around who she is from a site of failure to a landscape of partial, weird, and potentially enabling forms of personhood that are grounded in the not one of sexual difference. So this is the third, third section. Um, it's called Feminist Futures, Feminist Topographies. Donna Haraway's classic intervention in socialist feminist thought, A Cyborg Manifesto, describes a cyborg as the illegitimate, illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, a figuration of the dissolution of boundaries between human and non-human, animal and machine, and matter and meaning. Haraway uses the cyborg to grapple with science and technology's rearrangements of social relations <laughs> without dismissing technology's inevitable ascendancy. Um, and so this was a sort of turning away that distinguished quite a bit of feminist writing in the early Reagan era. era. In a cyborg world, what was once devalued can take on an oppositional political force based in new coalitions and new affinities. Thus, Haraway describes a co-opting of smallness in the late 20th century's technocratic social reality, a reality in which, ironically, quote, miniaturization has turned out to be about power. She writes, the nimble fingers of, the or of oriental women, the old fascination of little Anglo-Saxon Victorian girls with dolls' houses, women's enforced attention to the small, take on quite new dimensions. There might be a cyborg Alice taking account of these new dimensions. Since the publication of this essay, whose entry into the world was nothing short of controversial, um, scholars have veered between dismissing Haraway's cyborg as out of step with feminist concerns of the 21st century and mining the text as a still potent site for examining gender in an anti-essentialist frame. <coughs> Both appear to be true. As Alison Kafer has observed in Feminist Queer Crip, though Haraway positions women of color as a horizon of cyborg coalition building, the description of the, quote, nimble fingers of Asian women, supposedly cyborgs of global capitalism, is itself indebted to colonialist and racial stereotypes. But what about a cyborg Alice? What figure did Haraway have in mind here to attend to the ironic shifts in scale that characterized a technocratic future? I pose this question in line with my use of the term landscape to name Alice's inquiry into who she is, inseparable from the question of where she is, in an effort to trace a feminist topography through um, Alice's adventures in Wonderland and its sequel through the looking glass and what Alice found there. In the second installment of the Alice books, the cons 
conceptual space for thinking about sexual difference and being in the world as a problem of ones and twos is insistently topological. So Wonderland is now a chessboard. And Alice becomes the white queen's pawn in the hopes of reaching the eighth square and becoming the queen herself. So she says, you know, kind of in the opening few pages, oh, what fun it is, how I wish I was one of them, when she sees the chess pieces. I wouldn't mind being a pawn, if only I might join, though of course I should like to be a queen best. Alice's initial foray back to Wonderland in Looking Glass brings about a set of encounters that examines her subjectivity vis-a-vis -vis queenliness as a position that cannot and does not remain stable and unchanging through time and space. The cultural context of the 1870s betrayed a developing anxiety around gender that lodged itself in the figure of the queen. So while Ruskin borrows its rhetoric to laud the triumph of domestic femininity in a kind of famous uh, essay entitled Of Queen's Gardens, which is also from 1865, um, Queen Victoria herself inhabited a much more uncertain place with regard to sovereign feminine power, as Margaret Homans has argued. Because a queen was at once exceptional and infinitely proliferative, so for Ruskin, um, queens, the kind of position of a queen is available to any middle class woman. Its figuration may resemble Haraway's cyborg, denatured and profoundly boundary tra transgressing. In Looking Glass, the figure of the queen refuses a gender binary without shedding her origins in a deeply conservative um, and indeed tyrannical system of power. Furthermore, insofar as chess involves a sophisticated set of rules that will govern Alice's quest in the sequel, it is tempting to read the second installment of her adventures as rule-bound rather than free, as an experience of an attenuated subject rather than simply a figuration for different forms of movement and change. Critics have certainly said as much, according to, um, to James Kincaid, quote, gone for good is the open curiosity of the earlier figure. And the child seems to appear here only in a series of goodbyes. Um, Nina Auerbach further contends that Looking Glass, Alice is a person, quote, so thinned out, the vapid, passive to kneel drawing is an adequate illustration of her. It's quite harsh. Um, these readings are puzzling when we consider the opening pages of Looking Glass, in which Alice casually short, short circuits the logic of binary thinking that governs conventional ideas of Tunis. So um, this is a, a short passage. She had quite a long argument with her sister only the day before, all because Alice had begun with, well, let's pretend we're kings and queens, and her sister, who liked being very exact, had argued that they couldn't because there were only two of them. And Alice had been reduced at last to say, well, you can be one of them then, and I'll be all the rest. In this passage, the context of play generates a number of possibilities, all the rest out of only two of them. Here, Looking Glass starts with more traditional notions of the two. Um, so, you know, the opening pages also focus on um, these two kittens, one who's white and one who's black, um, only to dismantle, dismantle them through Alice's imaginative thinking in the story. I further want to call attention to the numerous instances of near pairing we find in Looking Glass in order to show how ones and twos coexist in a unique way in Carol's sequel. As the story develops, we encounter more instances of important twosomes, such as the Red Queen and the Right Queen, and notably Tweedledum and Tweedledee, um, who appear under a tree in the woods while Alice searches for a fo fork in the road. So, you know, perhaps itself a telling reminder of the dead end logic of binary oppositions. As the White Queen's pawn in the beginning of her adventure, Alice can only move diagonally across the chessboard, which is in strict opposition to the queens, who move at a completely different pace. In a garden of talking flowers, Alice encounters the Red Queen, who instructs her in how she may be a queen as well. And the narrator notes, just at this moment, somehow, somehow or other, they began to run. The Red Queen is already set apart by her movements, which seem to operate with no fixed guidelines, as Alice noticed, despite the Queen chanting, faster, faster. Um, so I'm just going to read a, a short section. Well, in our country, said Alice, still panting a little, you generally get to somewhere else if you ran very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. <laughs> 
A slow sort of country, said the queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. <laughs> so the Red Queen moves at a speed that can't be measured by a temporal scale drawn from the reality outside of the fantasy world. Yet the Red Queen's speed is more than a vague, inexplicable flux, since she demonstrates a clear knowledge of the counting that marks difference. So the queen says, at the end of two yards, she said, putting in a peg to mark the distance, I shall give you your directions. At the end of three yards, I shall repeat them for fear of your forgetting them. At the end of four, I shall say goodbye. And at the end of five, I shall go. The Red Queen finally instructs Alice to reach the eighth square while telling her that along the way, she must remember who you are. The counting seems to set apart the distinctiveness of each encounter precisely by collapsing space and time, as if a continuous rupturing came between four and five yards. This counting disturbs Alice's assurance of being who she is in a stable continuum of the, quote, latitudes and longitudes she refers to as she falls down the rabbit hole in Wonderland. Both the Red Queen and the Right Queen exist in separate temporal registers, as Alice discovers when she, might, she meets the White Queen later um, in the chapter Wool and Water. The White Queen, frazzled and seemingly helpless, quote, lives backwards, which proves to be an advantage since, as she said, one's memory works both ways. In a subtle shift, the story turns the effect of living backwards for the White Queen into a future orientation, since the Queen remembers and is often traumatized by what will happen next, rather than what has happened before. The White Queen, who is, quote, just 101 five months in a day, renders fully what the Red Queen points towards in her velocity. A possible reframing of the conditions of futurity through the figures least likely to embody it. So here it's just these two older women. When Alice responds incredulously to her age, claiming one can't believe impossible things, the White Queen tells her, when I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day why sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. In this chess game, the queens embody a symbolic register of horizontal movement that is at a remove from conventional progress, the conventional progress of time and space. It is worth noting that according to the rules of chess, the queen can move any number of squares in any direction. Um, this ultimate freedom translates into the eccentric movements of the red queen and the right queen in Wonderland. Subsequently, it is easy to see how Looking Glass seeks to unravel the exceptional oneness of the position of queen. Not only can we have two queens in Wonderland, we might even have three, as Alice's quest reveals when she finally arrives at the eighth square, only to find the red and white queen already there, bickering. Feminine singularity, the problem of the non-originary one, and feminine collectivity, the problem of the two or more in line with the bad copy, seem inextricable from one another. We see Alice pondering this exact problem as she enters the forest in Looking Glass Insects, uh, that's the name of the chapter, only to arrive face to face with her own possible extinction. The forest presents no topos of original femininity. As Alice observes, the myth of receiving one's identity and one's fate by being named has evaporated. Um, so she says, this must be the wood, she said thoughtfully to herself, where things have no names. I wonder what will become of my name when I go in. I shouldn't like to lose it at all, because they'd have to give me another, and it would most certainly be an ugly one. At this moment, a fawn appears, so an actual sort of animal, not a, not a fantasy creature, um, prompting a question that suggests exhilaration rather than tragedy. She stood silent for a moment, thinking, then she suddenly began again. Then it really has happened, after all, and now, who am I? This particular moment in which all Alice can remember is that her name begins with an L, has been glossed by several critics um, and several editors, such as Martin Gardner, as well as um, UC Knopfelmacher, who attempt to unravel the meaning of L, typically resorting to rather bland biographical speculation. So the L can stand for little, for instance. I suggest that what is at stake here is more than the arbitrariness of naming or the construction of meaning in a proper name. 
The narrative calls attention to the gendered foundations on which, on which Alice's identity rests, on which the entire fraught practice of naming rests. Haraway writes, consciousness of exclusion through naming is acute. Identities seem contradictory, partial, strategic. Often the seeking out of a form of feminist and anti-racist justice requires a name and a subject as a starting point from which to depart, however uncertain that foundational practice. For feminist scholarship, naming thus becomes a way to conceive of difference in only juridical or identitarian terms, as Linhofer argues, and to delimit disciplinary and institutional boundaries. In Looking Glass, <coughs> Alice's forgetting of her name reveals the opposite. Her girlhood is merely a trace, an after effect of those efforts to constitute the authentic and the originary in a name. And yet, despite this chapter's dominant mode of forgetting, it is one of the more memorable scenes from Looking Glass and one that has generated the most attention from theorists. For Gilles Deleuze, quote, the loss of the proper name is the adventure which is repeated throughout all of Alice's adventures. The absence of fixed identity for Deleuze is exchanged for the paradox of infinite identity, which eludes the present and any presuppositions towards depth. Luce Irgaray's This Sex Which Is Not One begins with the meditation and rewriting of this encounter. Caroline Burke has elucidated Irgaray's reading of Alice's invocation of an L and the following observation. There is no answer other, other than her self-renaming. L is, of course, multiple in the Irgaray's reading, LL, the third person feminine, both singular and plural. To begin with L means to learn that the female self is multiple. So Alice's forgetting of her name locates femininity elsewhere than in a stable reproductive genealogy. Read through the prism of various theoretical engagements, this moment reminds us further that gendering, here again only registered as a trace, eludes stable ideas of time and self-presence. I therefore suggest that Alice's profound loss of her signifying particularity in the forest is less about a radical instance of doubt in the vein of skepticism than it is about a severing from those forms of clearly identical difference that naming mandates. For Alain Badiou, the proper name is numerical insofar as withdrawing from it becomes the domain of the void, of the empty set in Cantorian mathematical terms. So it's a set with no elements. This negates universalist ideas of oneness, becoming instead, quote, the unpresentation and the unbeing of the one. Losing her name is therefore freeing rather than alienating because this temporary opacity allows Alice to reconsider herself within new and different relationships. For an instant, Alice wanders through the woods tenderly clutching and speaking with the fawn, who bounds away out of fear the moment the old hierarchies are reinstituted. I'm a fawn, it cried out in a, vo in a voice of delight. And dear me, you're a human child. A sudden look of alarm came in, into its beautiful brown eyes, and in another moment, it had darted away at full speed. What Alice shows us here and elsewhere in the Alice books is a certain way of thinking about gender as merely emergent, less tied to common ways of mix, making and fixing meaning, you know, in and through proper names, than to the surprising realm of counting. We might say that the Alice books collectively understand, as Claire Hemmings has suggested, gender as a way of asking questions of relationships and the world. Troubled by origins, the fictional Alice seeks other affinities, other ones and twos, as Haraway's essay imagines. So halfway through Alice's adventures in Wonderland, Alice muses on the impossibility of her existence in, the, in, in Wonderland, in this fantasy world. I almost wish I hadn't gone down that rabbit hole. And yet, it's rather curious, you know, this sort of life. I do wonder what can have happened to me. When I used to read fairy tales, I fancied that kind of thing never happened, and now here I am in the middle of one. Such self-consciousness about fictional genres' capacity to create worlds and define arcs of yet unthought possibility strains against the Alice's book's bracketing poems, such as the preface to Looking Glass, which evokes a different sort of loss, the end of childhood, as time <coughs> passes and, quote, envious years would say forget. The author and the real Alice Little may be a melancholy, half a life asunder, but the literary Alice finds herself in a register of counting that highlights alternative ways of conceptualizing her remove from the world of neat gender division and difference. 
She thus inhabits a near impossible realm of signification that exceeds Kincaid's claim that the Victorian child, quote, was a difference, but it was a difference formed by a culture and inscribed within categories of the perceivable. Not only does counting allow Alice's femininity freedom outside recognizable bounds of otherness that circumscribe Victorian ide ideological notions of childhood, it also suggests a radical rethinking of sexual difference that takes shape within the deceptively simple notion of ones and twos. Thank you.